Coming up, can storytelling impact scientific understanding? One theoretical physicist thinks it's essential. And that changes the way you think about science when it kind of makes your heart beat fast or you know makes those little hairs on the back of your neck stand up. And making math fun and accessible. The curator at America's only math museum says that's not an oxymoron. I think the most important thing you can take away is that you personally can be involved with math and you can create mathematical ideas and structures that are beautiful and exciting. Exploring the frontiers of science. Probing cutting edge technologies. Seeking answers to the big questions. Welcome to SciTech Central. Brian Greene is a theoretical physicist who's made important contributions to string theory. He's also a best-selling author. At a recent event in Orlando, he presented a reimagined Greek myth, bringing science to his audience as an emotional, even visceral experience. UCF Celebrates the Arts is a week-long festival that includes many art forms. Part of its mission is exploring ways to melt science and art. For Brian Greene, the event presented an important opportunity. UCF has a really wonderful program that is a way for the community to come together where it's not those that like art go to the opera or to the symphony. Those that like science go to the lecture. Let's come together and get people to engage with the scientific ideas through the art. Then they can have an emotional experience of science and that changes the way you think about science when it kind of makes your heart beat fast. That's a different way of engaging with science. Green believes that storytelling is key to sharing complex scientific principles with the general audience. The most powerful strategy that I've found for communicating abstract ideas is to not only translate them from the mathematics, which very few of us speak, into ordinary language that can be accessible, but if you can take those ideas and weave them into a story, the human brain has got to engage with story differently than anything else. I'll be on stage talking about ideas, and I feel a certain engagement, but then if I shift into story mode, I feel as though the audience collectively leans a few degrees forward because the brain, the mind, the spirit is moved by story, and if the science is woven into the story, it's almost a, a painless way for the science to have a way in. To reach more members of his audience, Green turned to a classic Greek story. How many people are familiar with the original myth? All right, so just to make sure, what does Icarus do? He flies too near the sun and he crashes into the sea. So the moral of the story is you don't do what daddy says and you die. <laughs> Now look, I don't know about you, but that always bothered me from the very first time I encountered that story. And as I got older and became a scientist, it bothered me for a different reason. Because in order to make great breakthroughs in science, in order to push the envelope of understanding, you have got to go against what your elders tell you. You've got to fearlessly go out into the unknown. That is what scientific exploration is all about. Green collaborated with several artists to turn his children's book, Icarus at the Edge of Time, into a multimedia performance that dramatizes Einstein's theory of relativity. Icarus heard the voice of the commander, his father, over the address system. All hands to stations, race for emergency course diversion. We're navigating to avoid an unchartered black hole. A black hole? Cool! If you go to this piece and know nothing about the physics, you won't leave being able to do research on the general theory of relativity, but you will leave with a sense of what goes on near a black hole by virtue of just going for a ride in a story. I, I hope kids see this and leave with a renewed sense of how science is a wonderful story of adventure. Pulling away for the last time, Icarus let out a cry of victory! Ha-ha! <laughs> That'll definitely be remembered! Thank you very much.
Brian Greene's main professional pursuit is the esoteric field of string theory. He's also passionate about inspiring others to explore the infinite marvels that surround us. I think the wonder of the universe is that there is such a wealth of distinct phenomenon that happen out there from formation of stars and galaxies to planets to all of the processes that are required for life. And the amazing thing is that underlying it all are some simple patterns that mathematics, physics, they can capture. And there's nothing to me that's more thrilling than to see a few patterns laid out in a few equations and to recognize that within that is all of the stuff that we see around us. If you can feel that, I think there's really nothing more thrilling than that. Many people know about Einstein's theory of relativity. Not very many know how Einstein came to his understanding of the theory. Brian Greene recently sat down with actor Alan Alda to discuss and demonstrate some of the thinking that led to one of the greatest scientific achievements in history. In the piece tonight, he, he talks about that moment when he imagined a man falling off a building. Happiest thought of his life. Happiest thought of his life. <laughs> why, why was that the happiest thought? Because that sounds like he's saying it's the most central image to all his thinking. Yeah, that was the key idea that propelled him toward the general theory of relativity. See, gravity is a, is a difficult subject. It's hard to even figure out a way in to a description of the force of gravity at the level that Einstein was searching for. What he realized was that a certain kind of motion, freely falling motion, in essence counteracts gravity, can eliminate gravity, which means in any situation where there's gravity, if you don't want to have to deal with it directly, just execute a certain kind of motion. Jump out a window, and then gravity goes away. What? <laughs> You jump out the window, gravity makes a quick entrance. <laughs> actually, it, it, it actually, it doesn't. It doesn't. So you jump out the window, what actually happens from Einstein's perspective is that the ground is just rushing up and hitting you. You're not being pulled down by gravity from Einstein's perspective. I mean, when Newton was sitting there under the tree, <laughs> yes. according to Einstein, it was not that the apple fell on his head. His head rushed up and hit the apple. <laughs> And that's Einstein's view. Now, I, I can show you this thing. Yeah, yeah I, right, I, right. you can, can show you us. Bring, can you bring my little water thingy out there, whoever may be backstage here, here listening to us? <laughs> right, here we go. So, so this idea of, of getting rid of gravity by going into freely falling motion can be illustrated by a little experiment. So I'm, I'm going to do it because I don't want you to get all wet. So, so what I'm going to do is let me describe it first. When I take off this cap, air pressure is going to be entering into the bottle, and water is going to spew out a few holes that I have here, because gravity is going to pull down on the water. Uh -huh. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to let the bottle go into free fall and watch that the water won't spray out any longer. Right? So that's what you should look for. OK, here we go. All right, right? So here goes the water. Oh, oh sorry about that. Right. <laughs> so um, now watch when I let it go. Holy Did you moly! See that, right? Uh, one more time. Gravity right. goes away. Right. See, there it is. All right. Now, can, that's a great trick. Yeah, it is. Can, can Einstein? You, right? Can you explain why we just saw what we saw? Yeah. So as the bottle is in free fall it no longer feels the force of gravity, right? I mean, another way of thinking about it that maybe is even you know, more visceral than this little demonstration is, if you are standing on a scale, right? You look down, you see whatever, you know, 150, 160 pounds for me, something like that, right? If I jump out of the window with a scale at my feet and I look down on it, what does the reading go to? It goes to zero, because the scale and me, we are moving together. So in that sense, I'm no longer pushing on the scale. I'm no longer experiencing gravity as I did when I'm standing here on the stage. 
So if you can counter gravity, if you can cancel it out by going into this motion, Einstein realized the reverse was also true. You could mock up gravity, you could simulate gravity by accelerating too. So that's where you get to a car turning. Exactly. And you, st you feel the, mo you, you, you know, it's no longer what you feel in an elevator, which is nothing. Yes. And even though you and the elevator are falling. That's right. If you cut the cable of an elevator, then indeed you and the elevator will fall together just like the water in the bottle fall together, just like the scale of my feet fall together and you don't feel anything. The exact reverse of that is now take an elevator, an empty space, no gravity, empty space, and pull up on the cable, making the elevator accelerate in that direction. If you're in that elevator, you will now feel your feet pressing against the floor because the floor is pushing up against you. You will have simulated gravity. Why is that important? Einstein understands motion really well, but he doesn't understand gravity. Now he has reduced gravity to motion, accelerated motion. That gives him a way in, and it does take him a good eight years to fill in all the details, but that yields the general theory of relativity. But you just said Einstein didn't understand gravity very well. He didn't in 1907. 1915, he takes this idea and parlays it into a single equation that describes the force of gravity in a way that had never been achieved. Carl Sagan died almost 17 years ago, so perhaps some of you are unfamiliar with his work and legacy, but if you enjoy the work of Bill Nye, Neil deGrasse Tyson, or even us here at SciShow, if you easily get sucked into the movie Contact, or have ever geeked out over the current location of Voyager 1, then Sagan has influenced your life. The image that is probably most associated with Sagan, that would be the pale blue dot, the famous photograph of Earth taken by Voyager 1 on February 14, 1990, as it approached the edge of the solar system. That is what our home looks like from six billion kilometers away. Some people might groan at the mere thought of math. A former hedge fund analyst is out to prove that math can be anything but boring. And it seems he's succeeding. The National Museum of Mathematics, or MoMath as it likes to be called, is the only math museum in the country. Glenn Whitney, a Harvard graduate who later taught mathematics at the University of Michigan and worked as a quantitative analyst at a Long Island hedge fund, had the idea to open it after a small Nassau County math museum he once enjoyed with his family suddenly closed in 2006. We sort of have this strange attitude toward mathematics, and I've seen it, you know, at a party. It's okay to say, hey, you know, I was terrible at math, weren't you? You know, that kind of thing. It's, it's socially acceptable. You would never say, I know, I could never really read very well. It just, it wouldn't happen. So we have a problem, it's holding us back, and I wanted to see if I could do something about it. Whitney and collaborators have raised $23 million so far for the museum. And already the 19,000 square foot space with 30 unique math exhibits of two floors is attracting many more visitors than expected. Those exhibits are all about turning math from abstract concepts into things you can touch and feel and do. What I need you to do now is stand here in one of these uh, two red circles. I'll get the other one. So, so tell me what this is. Okay, well this oh. is called Human Tree. If you hold your uh, arms up in the air, uh, then uh, you're going to see lots of copies of yourself. If you, if you lean over onto that console and hit the word yes, then we'll actually combine our images. And uh, there you go. Now you're on my shoulders and uh, I'm on your shoulders. And now the two of us are actually collaborating uh, to create this pattern. So what does this teach kids about math? Uh, well, first off, it t teaches kids that math is not just about numbers, but also about patterns. Uh -huh. uh, it teaches them you can work together. Here we are working together to make this. Uh -huh. uh, and it uh, teaches kids that beautiful things come out from very simple ideas. An exhibit called Math Square, an ever-changing display that detects your feet. Its goal? To make the math puzzles and games that emerge a kind of contact sport. Yeah, if you step over there, yeah, see now that's your region, this is my region. I like the math square that's behind me because it has a lot of angles and a lot of fun shapes and a lot of fun activities. 
On the ground floor, the museum's target audience of fourth to eighth graders aren't the only ones lining up to ride the square-wheeled trikes. I'll take the big one if you don't no, mind. that's it's... just fine. I've got more uh, practice on this one. So this is the one that I always read about here. Exactly. What are we learning? Uh, well, so again, it's all about that surprise in mathematics. And if you just uh, roll away, you don't even need to use your hands. And uh, <laughs> the point is, everybody knows that a square wheel can't possibly roll, right? That's right. And so we want to show here that with math, you can make things that seem to be impossible, you can make them possible. It's that element of surprise. It's that element of, like, I've never seen anything like that before. That's what we want to show kids here on the square wheel track. And you know what? It's a heck of a lot of fun. All right. <laughs> There you go. All right. But for Whitney, there's a far more serious side to the exhibits, something that continues to motivate him. We want to have experiences that can be entered at a sort of visceral level. If we spark curiosity, then I mean, that illumination, you know, it takes work like anything, like, you know, like figuring out how to play the flute better. You have to practice. So that illumination is going to come through the kind of attention that maybe can't happen in a museum, uh, but we can light the spark here. What do you hope people take away from the a visit to the math museum? I think the most important thing you can take away from when, when you come here is that you personally can be involved with math and you can create mathematical ideas and structures that are beautiful and exciting. You can make your own 3D sculpture at the Mathenaeum. You can make your own set of tiles that interlock in some unique way at Tile Factory. Everyone is able to be involved with math and do something beautiful and exciting. Doug Roadhamel's upcycled art sprinkled throughout the Orlando Science Center delights the eyes. Even more important, he wants to prod visitors to think about what's possible. My name's Doug Roadhamel and I'm an artist. I work at a coffee shop and you know, one of my jobs there is to take out all the trash and it's kind of disheartening because all of this is going to go somewhere so it's nice to be able to pull some of that out and make it into something. Here we have submarines that are made of cardboard and parts and pieces, slurpy straws and toilet paper tubes. I kind of build it with the intent that it's a piece of artwork, but I always tell everyone to look closer and see what parts you might recognize. And when they start doing that, it's, oh, it's, that's a bottle cap. Maybe I can make something like that when I go home. On the second floor, I have a large 16-foot mobile made completely out of cardboard and the surplus parts. On the first floor, I have jellyfish hanging from the ceiling that are made from Coke bottles and salad containers and plastic parts and pieces. It kind of shows people that things aren't always what they seem they are, and that's how problems get solved, just by looking at things in a different perspective rather than always what they are. I kind of hope that gets translated into my work. People from all walks of life are taking to the stage to tell stories of how science has made a difference in their lives. By sharing their tales, both the performers and the audience start to see science differently. Please welcome to the stage, Bradford Jordan. Third grade show and tell is a high stakes game. Especially in Mr. Denholm's class at Castleview Elementary School in Riverside, California. Somewhere, rational or not, I had this vague, dark vision of the city just coming unraveled. So I'm a medical actor. I am someone that acts out a character that has an ailment for medical students. But a few months ago, I show up to work thinking that that day I was going to have an STD. And I get there and my supervisor hands me the schedule and he says there's been a change and that today I'm going to give birth. And I'm gonna give birth three times. They're all sharing stories about science. Ben Lilly is a former particle physicist who turned to the stage for a way to combine science and storytelling. What's missing is talking about science in how it affects people and how it intersects with people's lives. That's what I'd been, been flailing around trying to find. I tried to do a stand-up set, I tried to do a solo show, those were both terrible. We wanted science in people's lives, stories, just put them together and do it. Lily met another physicist turned storyteller and the two founded The Story Collider, a podcast of true personal stories about science told live on stage. Senior producer Aaron Barker was skeptical at first. 
I thought it was a dumb idea. I thought it's gonna be so boring. No one's gonna wanna come to that. <laughs> but I went to the first show for the first time. It was really amazing and it turns out Science stories are not stories about, you know, that class in high school that you skip. Adam Becker is a freelance astrophysicist and veteran story collider performer who sees it as a way to talk to people about science without a lecture. I like telling stories. I like talking about science to people. You know, normally I think of, okay, I'm gonna go talk to a kindergarten class now, or I'm gonna go, you know, help out a museum now. I hadn't really thought of, oh, let me connect with people on an emotional level about science. An imposter syndrome is, is when you think that everybody else belongs where you are because they're clearly talented and intelligent and you don't. And what made it worse, strangely, was that I had this incredibly excellent PhD advisor named Dragan Hutterer. There are stories about love and courage and goals and ambitions, and I think that's what surprised me the most. Today I had worked with him. We were equals. He came to me for help. I told him what to do, and it was a good idea. I sounded smart. I sounded informed. I sounded like I belonged, and I felt good. Storytellers, like the audience, are a mix of scientists and non-scientists. We have senior scientists, we have grad students, we have postdocs, but then we also have people who've had no formal contact with science since like middle school uh, science class. The idea of giving fake birth is causing me so much more panic and anxiety than the idea of giving real birth or having a baby at all, and I'm just staring at my supervisor and I'm like, I have no other choice but to quit this job right now. Part of what we really want is to show that science really does affect everyone. Um, and so we try to get as broad a spectrum as we can. What's the first rule of Story Collider? That's right, there right. is no learning at Story Collider. The science here is for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> but audiences do learn. The Story Collider's producers work with performers to give their stories a narrative arc and simplify the hard science. We find that if there's just one piece of jargon or just one piece of complicated science in a story that the audience really takes it in and they will actually remember it for a really long time. But if it gets too bogged down, then it becomes too complicated. And that orbiting where two storms rotate around each other when they get close is called the Fujiwara effect. And I knew that I had never seen this before, not even in a scientific paper and definitely not when I was sitting on the ground in the place where the weather was gonna happen. Story Collider is not alone in its pursuit to make science digestible for a wider audience. Blogs, YouTube channels, and other podcasts are jogging memories of high school science class for a growing number of people. But Story Collider's creators think there's something special about this medium that connects personal experience and science. You really need to, to get it a sense of intimacy between the storyteller and the audience. And doing it live really helps. And then audio podcasts are great for that. Um, you know, you're, you're sitting there mostly with headphones, just listening to this one other person's voice, and it really helps people get into, uh, into the stories. I think the more that people remember that science is a human enterprise, it's a thing that people do, and those people, you know, are their neighbors and their friends, the better, you know, put a human face on it. So I went home and I said, Dad, I need your help. I need to win show and tell. Then my dad, Hero, reaches into this uh, Tupperware and like, like Arthur pulling his sword from the stone, he lifts up in front of everyone in the class. Yes, it's true, it's real, a human brain. Take that Hikaru Yamamoto. That's all for this week on SciTech Central. Thanks for watching. Join us next time for more stories from the frontiers of science and technology.